right, good morning. We are looking at chapter 16.4, and you might be sitting there going, wow, what is going on here? Yes, I am filming a different computer because the school's network is now even worse. I can't even get anything to pull up as opposed to before when it would pull it up and then it would drop it, right? We kept uh, having to reopen it. So now we're looking just at it at the, a different computer that's not on the network and just has the file on it on coming from a thumb drive. So let's get through this and everything should be just fine. So what we can say here, waves on a string. So right now you're thinking about things like a guitar, right? A guitar string, really a piano, a true piano has a string that maybe you just can't see it. It's inside the computer or inside the computer, inside the piano, depending on if it's like a grand piano where you can open them up and see the strings or an upright computer. Uh, upright piano and you can't see the strings um, or whatever other kind of like instrument that reminds you of like a guitar, a violin, a bass, uh, whatever. You say what it is, it's a stringed instrument and here's what's going on. When you disturb the string, you put a wave onto it and the wave starts to vibrate at its natural frequency. Now, first of all, all of these, for whatever reason, the picture did not carry the other endpoint on here so we want to make sure that the string has a is it as is fixed it's attached at both ends and these are all supposed to be the same length even if they don't look like i'm lining them up very well they're all the same length string okay now the first thing that we have to know is that when the string vibrates it vibrates and produces the sound that it's, it's that is its fundamental frequency also i should say that we produce standing waves on the string and the most important one is the longest wave that will fit on the string, which is called the fundamental frequency. The wave goes this direction, reflects off the other side, comes back. It's not that a crest is overlapping a trough right here. It's really that a crest is overlapping a crest at the same time. And as the wave propagates through, a trough overlaps a trough. And what we actually end up with is the tallest point of the wave at that spot. Okay, there's the vibration. Now, we also mentioned to you in studying sound that uh, the reason why the guitar sounds different than the piano, even though they're both stringed instruments, is because of the harmonics that are with, with it. And we're not going to study the thousands of harmonics that are there. We're just going to study the first simple few. For example, the next smaller wavelength, higher frequency that fits on this would be one where the wave does this and then doubles back on itself and creates two high points. We're going to call those high points the antinodes in a moment. And we're going to call these, I always call them, I would say in quotes, affectionately footballs. But since the AP test consistently refers to them as the loops, I'm going to use that phrase, that terminology too. So the fundamental frequency has one loop. The, uh, the second harmonic has two loops. The third harmonic is going to have three loops. They're all supposed to be the same amplitude. I don't even know that they have to be the same amplitude, but we should be making them all the same amplitude. And then the, the, that was the third harmonic. The fourth harmonic has four loops. So it completes one wavelength halfway, completes another wavelength the other halfway. And then we just kind of fill this in. I'm trying to make these dashed as we go through, but I'm just not doing a very good job of it. Okay, so one loop for the fundamental, the first harmonic, two loops for the second harmonic, three loops for the third harmonic, four loops for the fourth harmonic. And then what we can say about this is since we know that a wave has to contain both a crest and a trough, so a standing wave therefore contains both a crest uh, or contains really just two loops. This is one wavelength. Then what that tells us about the fundamental frequency is this is only half of a wavelength. Half the wave is missing. Okay, now it's not a big deal that we only have half of a wavelength, but it is a big deal that you know that that is just half of a wavelength. Then this one here, the second harmonic is exactly perfectly a wavelength. Then the third harmonic is one wavelength plus a half, so one and a half wavelengths. And then the fourth harmonic contains four loops, two loops being a wavelength, contains two wavelengths. All right, it's that easy. You just got to kind of keep it all together. So here's a slide that kind of shows all of that. Let's make this a little bit, move it over a little bit. Somehow it got over behind the toolbar. There we go. Okay, so fundamental frequency, half a wavelength fits L, 
So that means that the actual wavelength, if you were to continue this drawing, I don't recommend that you do that on this picture right here. The continued drawing would show this going out here and completing a full another wavelength out here. But it's not actually there because the wave is on the string and the string doesn't exist past this endpoint. So you just have to know that the wavelength is twice the length of the string. Okay. And then all the other stuff like we talked about. And there is a formula that uh, explains uh, what the wavelength for each of the harmonics is. So when you want the first harmonic, you put a 1 in here, it's 2L. When you want the second harmonic, it's 2L divided by 2. That Then the second harmonic must just be L. And when you want the third harmonic, it's 2L over 3. That's, uh, well, that's because, see, that's, see, now it sounds funny, because when you say 2 L over three for the third harmonic. Uh, the I guess I can explain it this way. It does make sense. Is that the wavelength is now two thirds of the length of the string? Sorry, my brain was trying to think backwards about that, and then so on and so forth. So when we put a four in here for the fourth harmonic, you get that the wavelength is half of the length of the string. Okay, so a decent formula that does just speeds things up in case they ask us about the thousandth harmonic and we knew the length of the string, we wouldn't have to draw this all the way out. Uh, on the notes online, you should see a, a GIF of this that shows the wave being sent out and then reflecting back on itself and creates a standing wave. So you can understand how this picture comes about on a string. You started the disturbance right here, it goes out and then it comes back on itself. And that's how we get our, our standing wave. Sorry, those are supposed to connect, okay? So look at the GIF on the Google Slides. And pause this if you need time to copy this down because I'm going to move on. But I guess before I move on, I should mention one more thing. We call the loops antinodes and we call the places where the destructive interference occurred the nodes. So you can see that how many nodes there are. In fact, there could be a formula that I think says the nodes equals the harmonic plus one. Right. So you could almost say and you don't need this. I'll just write it down since you're busy copying the note, the notes, the nodes equals uh, n plus one, right? Because if they are on the third harmonic, that's n equals three, you get four nodes. n equals four, you get five nodes, and so on and so forth. All right, I'm going to keep moving forward. Pause this if you need to. Uh, another good picture showing all of this going on here. Um, remember, we've always said to you over and over again every day, I haven't missed a day yet in this chapter, that says the speed of the wave is determined by the medium. All right, so therefore the speed of the wave is determined by the string. And right here you can see that we have like a guitar string. And you know that there are six guitar strings. And you know that each one sounds different. And what are the factors that go into it? Well, number one, you can see one of the factors. They're not all the same material. They're not all the same thickness. Number two, you can feel the tension. So the combination of tension plus also the string itself, the M over L is what we're going to call, it's called linear mass density. But technically what it is, is that's the string. The tension you put it at plus that string gives you the speed that's going to travel down that string. Then we know that that speed, I don't know where to put this, but this is an important connection, that that speed on the string is equal to the wavelength or whichever, I don't know, I like to still talk about the fundamental frequency for that. Fundamental, if we were talking about the fundamental frequency, then we know that the wavelength for that has to be 2L, right? So you could substitute a 2L in for this and we have a relationship here. Now, you might notice something that when you pluck the string, it's not the wave on the string that we care about. It's the wave that travels through the air that we care about. So how does this formula on the string then relate to what's happening in the air? Well, the wave on the string is not going to be traveling the same speed as the wave in the air. How, what's their relationship? Well, we don't know. We have to see which particular string we're talking about because they're all unique. The wavelength also varies. But what doesn't vary is the fundamental frequency, okay? So therefore, we would say the wavelength in air and the velocity in air are related to each other 
by whatever the fundamental frequency of the string is. And the fundamental frequency of the string, that's a thing that stays constant. That was in your notes a couple days ago, that the fundamental frequency, the frequency stays constant, and it's the velocity and the wavelength that, that differ, that can change because one change, the other one changes. If the velocity goes up, the wavelength goes up. Velocity goes down, the wavelength goes down. But the frequency stays constant. Okay? So can you see a progression? That we could use this formula to become this formula. And then we could use this formula to become this formula so that we can solve for this as the final answer. That's a typical AP style problem that could be answered there is what's the wavelength in air? Okay? And... The only way we're going to know the wavelength in air is by doing all the other stuff so we can figure out the fundamental frequency or probably something else has to be given here too. Most likely these are going to be the givens. Somebody tightens the tensioner on the guitar string to this tension. This guitar string has a linear mass density of this amount. So then you can use that to figure out the string, the string velocity. The wavelength, they, that's the length of the string, right? Double it. Now, now you know the fundamental frequency. Now take that into air and you can figure out the wavelength in air. Very common progression. You can count on that most likely on your test. Count on it most likely. Uh, here's your first three of four examples today. In the first example, it says a guitar string is 64 centimeters long. If the speed of sound is 343, what is the lowest possible frequency the string can hold? So you pause this if you want to write these down. Otherwise, I'm going to just keep moving through this. Lowest frequency is the fundamental frequency. But why would it be the fundamental frequency? Because in order for this formula to be true on the string, whatever has the lowest frequency is the longest wavelength. What is the longest wave that you can fit on the string? Don't copy this down. It's not this answer. That looks like a wave, doesn't it? But the actual longest wavelength that will fit on this string is this wave even though half of it's not even on there. So the fundamental frequency is one loop. So now if you want to copy this down, it's a good idea. One loop looks like that. Okay. So what we know about the fundamental frequency is that the uh, wavelength equals twice the length of the string because of that second loop that we didn't include in our, or I had in the picture for a moment and erased it. So we're going to say two times 0.64, I'm going to use meters for this, so everything seems SI, that becomes 1.28 meters as a wavelength, okay? Speed of sound is 343, so even though I don't know the speed on this string, I do know that the frequency on this string is the same as the frequency that would be going through the air. So if my wavelength is this, um, I don't know. I'm a little bit unhappy with how these things relate to each other based on these nice stories that I've given you so far, because somebody should be saying, well, wait a minute here. You know the length of the string, but that doesn't mean that you know what that wavelength is going to be in air. Uh, I'm not sure how to back myself out of that story because it is true. And we will see problems that follow that natural progression of what I just put on the last slide. But for this one, this is a pretty standard problem. And this is what we do. We take the length of the string, we double it to get the wavelength, and we just use the speed of sound. But technically, to me, it feels like it should be the speed on the string in order to match up to that frequency. But I'm going to go with it. Um, 343 equals 1.28 times the frequency. Solve for the frequency. My calculator said 268 hertz. No, 268, not 2 points. 268 waves per second. Question number two. All right, whenever you see a tuning fork, a tuning fork is a special device because what we know about a tuning fork is that it maintains a constant frequency. Frequency cannot be changed with the tuning fork. So what's going to change then is maybe... Length of string, type of string, tension in string is going to have all of the effects here. But they're telling us that this experiment was set up so that the 30 hertz wave generator, and a wave generator could actually be a machine, but it works just like a tuning fork. In other words, when set to a certain frequency, it only produces that frequency, in this case, 30 hertz. It does this on a 0.75 meter long string. 
and we get a pattern as shown. Now, what we know about this pattern is that this length right here, because it contains two loops, is one wavelength. So we now know that the wavelength is 0.75 meters on that string. We know that the frequency is 30 hertz on that string. So now we can figure out what the velocity is on that stream. So we're going to multiply wavelength times frequency. I put them in backward, but that's okay. It still works the same way. My calculator said 22.5 meters per second. One more and then one more. Question number three says a banjo has a string length of 80 centimeters. The speed of the disturbance on the string is 240 meters per second. What is the frequency of the fourth harmonic? Okay, fourth harmonic means four loops. There's two, there's two more. All right, so what do I know about the fourth harmonic is only two loops are required to make a wavelength. So therefore the wavelength must only be 40 centimeters or in other words, 0.4 meters. So if I have that the wavelength is 0.4 and the speed on the string is 240. Now I can solve for the frequency. I'm very troubled with example one because that really is kind of skipping over something there that bothers me and therefore doesn't make it correct. It's good enough for regular physics. It's not good enough for AP physics, but we're going to let it go. And I'm going to kind of clean that up with band-aids um, as we progress through the rest of this talking about sound. So frequency 240 divided by 0.4 comes out to be 600. Well, my velocity is written down wrong. I cut and pasted something wrong, but it is correct inside here. So I believe that answer is right. Okay, so there's examples one, two, and three. I think I have one more example. Okay, um, the E string, uh, the E2 string, Guitar string, sorry, I knew there was a word missing there somewhere, camera's in the way, has a linear mass density of three grams per meter. In other words, if you cut a meter long string, put it on the, on the uh, triple beam balance, it would mass out at about three grams. The tension is increased to 33 newtons, causing it to reach a frequency of 82 hertz. Okay, what is the speed of the vibration on the string? What is the length of the string? And then what is the wavelength in air? So this is a more complete question. This is like that natural progression that I was talking about. I did put some information in here. So those of you who don't know much about guitars can kind of get an idea of how this works. Um, scientific pitch notation for E2 string. Uh, I don't remember why it's called two, but it doesn't matter. You can see everything you need is in this problem. Um, uh yeah enough i'm in there that i need to point out so i think we're ready to go so first thing is i'm going to use the information given up here to figure out what the speed is on the string so the velocity on the string is based on what tension you set it to divided by its linear mass density and i think that the linear mass density has to be in kilograms per meter not grams per meter hmm it would make sense for having the units work out correctly. So I'm going to just go for it, that that should be changed to 0 0.003 kilograms per meter. Remember that, in, and I'm just going to do some unit work on this. You're probably still copying this down anyway. Remember that the units of Newtons is kilograms times meters over seconds squared. And then we're dividing this by kilograms over meters. And so... When you do that, the kilograms cancel out the kilograms, but the meters flip over to make meters squared over seconds squared, which is then square rooted, gives us meters per second. So that has to be in kilograms. I hope that doesn't make a problem with this problem because I don't know if I took that into consideration. Did I make an answer slide? Good, I did. That came out to be 105 meters per second. So let's just go with what we have here. Okay, we now have a speed. There's part A. Part B says, what is the length of the string? Okay, so what I know about this string is that what it's doing is it's vibrating at its fundamental frequency is the sound that I hear. When you use the tuner to tune your guitar string, you're tuning to the fundamental frequency of 82 hertz. So if I wanna know the length of the string, 
I might want to start by just finding out what's the wavelength that's going on with that string. So the wavelength equals the velocity divided by the frequency, which equals 105 divided by 82. But then once I get that number, that wavelength includes the wave part of it that goes way out here past. Remember, wavelength has to contain two loops. And I'm only seeing one of the loops on here. So when I get an answer for this wavelength, I got to cut that in half to get the length of the string. So this answer should have come out to be around one and a quarter. And then, so I'm expecting half of that. So I better see an answer around 55 centimeters. Uh, good, 0.64, I'll take that. So solving the 105 divided by 82 was 1.3 and then half of 1.3 came out to be 0.64. Let's stay with this slide and go 1.3 meters, and then the length of the string equals half of the wavelength, so that came out to be 0.64 meters. Okay, so that's what's going on on the string. Now we want to know what's the wavelength in air. So what do we know that's common? Well, first of all, what do we know about air? We know it's velocity, room temperature, around 343. But what we also know here is that whatever the fundamental frequency, that's what you hear, that's the frequency that's on the string as well. So that's equal to 82 hertz. So then we can figure out the wavelength in air by taking the 343 divided by the 82, and there's my wavelength. Comes out to be about four meters long. Think about that. Your eardrum is being hit by a, a wavelength. Four meters long is when it goes, you know, in two of those meters, it's pushing the, the membrane in and two of those meters is popping back out, and that exact moment or that exact motion makes your brain go, hey, I just heard the E2 guitar string. Crazy stuff. Chapter 16, homework number four is your assignment. It looks like this. Those are the five questions that you have. Thank you for playing along with this crazy setup, but it worked.